Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today, and uh, thanks for welcoming us to uh, Helsinki and the lovely weather and temperature. <laughs> uh, we were sharing the anecdote that I've brought far more layers uh, of clothing than Guillaume for this time around, so I'm enjoying it, the weather. Guillaume, maybe a little less so. So we have uh, roughly 25 minutes, and the objective of this is to make this a little bit conversational rather than an interview, and to share really primarily Guillaume his story as well as the story of Checkout and hopefully for the entrepreneurs in the, in the room, the founders in the room, to learn a little bit about uh, how Guillaume built Checkout and maybe some lessons and learnings uh, uh, that he has for us all. So by way of quick background, my name is Tom Stafford. I'm managing partner of uh, an investment firm called DST Global and we have the uh, honor of being uh, investors and shareholders in Checkout having uh, co-led a round of investment a number of years ago, the first ever round of investment, the Series A, of Checkout. Uh, Guillaume is obviously the founder and CEO of Checkout. And why don't we start with the origin story, as it were, the story of Checkout and uh, the path through uh, over the last few years. Sure, so thank you very much for having me here. And um, I was a repeat founder, so fundamentally this was like my third business. I had two business before this one and both of them were in payments. Um, and by being in payments, when you facilitate payments, uh, you have to work with banks historically. And that whole model was mostly broken uh, simply because like banks do a lot of things and they were not pure play uh, e-commerce, which was our focus. And uh, in 2009, when the Payment Service Directive 1 appeared in Europe, it gave the opportunity to fintech companies like ours to essentially disintermediate the whole value chain. So instead of being forced to work with banks, we had the opportunity to basically become a bank ourselves, become an acquiring bank. Um, that was a journey, took a bit of time. Uh, but essentially, the moment we saw that opportunity, it was the, the, you know, the idea behind Checkout. We have the opportunity to basically control that value chain, control what we sell, put the merchants directly to the payment methods instead of these like, multiple layers of technology and you know, historical players who are there who are eating margin and not making a lot of sense uh, and having a true tech-first approach. So the idea was really like based on the accumulated experience as a previous founder and employee also in, in the payment space since 2006 to do everything yourself. Um, and fundamentally, um, it took you know, seven years of bootstrapping until we had a product that we were really happy with. Uh, and then you came into the store. <laughs> I think that's a... And, and there's a kind of an, two, two interesting parts to that. Uh, one is... Um, that you ran the business profitably uh, in order to be bootstrapped for that six, seven plus years before we invested, but also that you didn't go for investment until you had the product you were happy with. W why did you wait for investment until that product, you had that product you really were happy with? So I think there's like a, um, we have a very special story and we were actually very lucky because early in the journey, um, so if, if I just rewrite history a little bit or I tell the story how it happened, in 2012, we applied to the FCA, which is the financial regulator of the UK. At the end of 2012, they gave us the license. And in 2013, we received what is called a principal membership of Visa MasterCard. So at that point in time, you're basically, you have the right to connect directly to the schemes. Uh, you're not going through Barclays, which was the historical provider we were using. Uh, and so fundamentally, um, you know, uh, we had an early client who saw the, the, the product because those licenses are public and they were like, hey, you have this. And that merchant, I mean, it's still a merchant today called DL Extreme, DX.com, selling electronics all around the world. And they created, you know, um, a, a flow of revenue that allowed us to bootstrap intelligently the company. And it didn't make us like rich in any way. It was not a lot of capital. And we were still in the early days where it was like, you know, one hire per quarter and would make decisions as a team who is the person we're hiring. But we were very methodical on how we built the business because to answer your question, the time is so big in payments. So the total addressable market, what we go after, that for us, it was really a matter of building the product properly. And um, there is a third step that quite often most people don't realize that when you have the gateway that connects the website or the application to the bank, when you have the bank, you have a third piece of technology that is behind. Um, and that's what we call a payment processor. And from 2013 to 2016, we built this uh, like, you know, heads down, uh, not public, but I gave up the CEO role for three years to be head of product because I was like, that's how we create value over the long term. And 
this is a life journey for me. Like, like I said, it's third company. I'm going to do this forever. I really enjoy what I'm doing. I enjoy building the company. And uh, the story goes that in 2016, we relaunched everything. We're now at that point in time in the UK, you know, uh, with all the FunTech uh, blossoming and like the Revolut, TransferWise, TransferGo, Azimo, they all became our clients because they're themselves competing with the bank. So it seems kind of counterintuitive to go and work with a bank. And then in 2018, we signed Netflix, Fair Play, uh, uh, for like a global deal. And that's where we realized that, you know, we took the company really far on a bootstrapping perspective. We have nearly 300 employees, but it's like, I've never been the CEO of such a big business. Uh, I've never had that experience. And I want to surround myself with like, you know, smarter people than me that are going to help me build the global business that we have today, essentially. So, so the catalyst then in sort of that 2018 timeframe was sort of the, the scaling, the quality of customers you now succeeded in pulling, which proved the product. And you were at that point then, an inflection point, you then chose to take capital to take an external investment. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so, uh, you know, for one Netflix who tells you yes, you usually have nine merchants who tell you, hey, you're not financially strong enough for us because ultimately our balance sheet was our retained earnings, the money that we keep. And we were not like immensely profitable. We were a bit profitable, but we would try to reinvest as much as possible. And I think like we, uh, when we set out to raise the Series A, I had what I call is my equation of value. And I had like four things that were important Have to me. Have you copyrighted that, the equation of value? Yeah, I probably should, but it's just like, it's each time I raise capital, I always try to say like, what am I optimizing for? It's like, what am I looking, what, what is the investor going to bring me in? We were looking for four things. We were looking for an operator, somebody who had experience in go-to-market and building and scaling global businesses. We were looking for somebody who had a very strong network and had you know, been part of some of the world's most meaningful tech companies and the Silicon Valley network and all the things we didn't have. We were looking for somebody who had experience in fintech and like, you know, like, because we believe that every fintech company is going to be a multi-product company. So like, you know, who can see a lot of fintech and somebody in Asia and uh, who had that experience in Asia and the network in Asia and you know, starting again from the bottom, the, or starting from the second one, which is the experience globally, that was you. I mean, nobody is better than DST for like a global network, being part of some of the most exceptional you know, tech journeys that have been kind of written. The number one was Inside Partner, who has been a very good firm to us also in terms of like helping us operate the business. They're both on the very early stage and a true operator. They buy businesses and operate those businesses. And then Mickey uh, from Rivet Capital for, for the FinTech piece and GIC for the Asia piece. And uh, um, you know, that equation of value was like literally written. We were like, that's what we want. Uh, and we optimized from there uh, going forward. You know, I think like and I was lucky that you gave me a, you know, a chance. I mean, maybe I should just return you the question. It's like, why did you choose Checkout when you saw us across all these decks that you see uh, uh, as an investor? Well, I think, uh, like you, we have an equation. Uh, it's not as copyrighted, perhaps, as your equation. But, but our equation you know, has multiple factors. But really, you can distill it down to three, which is team, TAM, and traction. And you know, TAM is undeniable. It's, so large we barely need to talk about the time of payments and indeed all the other things tangential to payments that you will touch. Traction was incredible for a bootstrap company that had no capital base to work with essentially other than retained earnings to have won the merchants you'd won and to build a product you'd, you'd built to have the license you had and, and sort of Netflix as, as one marquee client but many other clients that were very uh, discerning clients and customers meant that Traction was very very strong and Overall, though, we index almost all of our decision-making around the team. And really within team, we index to the founder. And so I decided to invest within 25, 30 minutes of meeting you in person. That was in the days we used to meet in person. That was before, before Zoom. Uh, or not before Zoom, but before we were doing deals over Zoom. And uh, ultimately, we, we index ourselves to, to, to the human being right, that's running the business. Because like you're saying, this is your your life's work, right? You're going to run this for a long time. The ultimate belief is that the founder embodies ownership, both in terms of actual ownership of the shares and the company, but also the ownership of the vision. And as the only person, therefore, who can derive the ability and the credibility to deliver on the vision quarter in, quarter out, but also year in, year out, and decade in, decade out. And if we think about the big technology companies, they're big because they compound. They keep on taking risk and achieving a reward. And we think founders can do that. So to your question, our, our equation is team, TAM, and traction. And uh, you check out and you hit all of those for us in a very meaningful way. 
So then we had to go into battle mode and make sure we could win the deal. But uh, ultimately, uh, you know, the decision was made very quickly. For so. the record and for the audience, I never ask him this question, so it's the first time he answers me. So I'm completely leveraging being here and being able to ask questions in front of a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, 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 the ultimate answer is that uh, the asset of a, of a great technology company, there's many assets, there's licenses and customers and revenues and balance sheet. But the biggest asset and the most important one is the team. Because if you don't have the right team and you can't establish the team and keep it driving forward, and particularly the founder, the business isn't going to achieve. I think this is a good point. So actually, I could, I could build on this. There's a few things. Is like when we, before, when we were bootstrapping and you know, like capitalizing on capital, which is here, there's, we've done it in two different ways. We've done it like when we had no capital at all. And then it was mostly about selling a mission and vision to like, you know, my colleagues and my partners uh, at the time because we weren't playing the traditional tech crunch game and raising a lot of money and our competitors were raising a lot of money and we were like heads down, let's build the best product, we're the underdog, it's like David versus Goliath and like we were like kind of, you know, uh, uh, boosting our, our energy and around this like competitive spirit, which I think is still very much in the company and like being frugal and smart on how we were using our resources. So there's a huge amount of like resource allocation as a CEO is like, how do you make good decisions with what you have? But then we graduated with suddenly like we have hundreds of million and now I think we, we have $800 million or 830 that we have raised. And then it became a completely different ball game because first of all, the merchants who were telling us no uh, because we didn't have enough balance sheet started telling us yes and you know think of Klarna, Facebook, like all these ones and then you have uh, basically and, and you know the thing is growing so fast and um, and I think it was a good investment decision when we see how we're growing this year but I think like taking a step back if you want to build a meaningful company you're basically and I really mean like a really large one you're basically as a CEO designing an operating system for humans or a human operating system is like, and people will call it like, a, like processes and admin and things like this. I don't necessarily, I think like, you know, processes like hinder innovation, you need to be, you need the right level of balance, but getting all your teams to interact well properly and like creating velocity and product and engineering and predictability, all these things are super important. And so the truth is when we raised the series A, it was mostly the founding team, like people who had been there, they had grown through the ranks. And across the last 24 months, we have rebuilt the whole executive team. And the founding team, some, some of the founding team, like the people who were there from the early days, uh, they're still here, many of them. They were just like, you know, they agreed that they had taken the ship to like, you know, from zero to a thousand people. And this year we hired like another thousand, we're at 1700 and next year we'll hire 1500 or 2000. And, and the reality is that you can only do this if you surround yourself with people who have the experience that you don't have. And so um, we went through that whole exercise of saying, hey, we want people who've seen the movie before. We did all these hires this year, like, you know, the CTO from Twilio, the chief revenue officer from WeWork, the CFO recently from T. Rowe Price, people who have seen scale, who have, you know, seen the movie before. And I think like, that's a huge part of you know, why I'm comfortable about where the company is going in terms of future because yes, we have a ton of problems, we're growing super fast and you have all the high growth problems still, but I'm surrounded by people that I trust who, who I can delegate decisions entirely and I think a good uh, CEO should you know, push decisions as much as possible away from him. It's about pushing decisions down into the org. Um, but I wouldn't be able to do it if I hadn't had the right team. So like huge amount of focus across like, you know, post fundraising was like building a team that can basically execute at scale in terms of where we're, we want to go. But I think it's interesting you said it's sort of post fundraising that happens. I, I, I think that's sort of almost incorrect in some respects in that you're always building the team and ultimately building the best team doesn't matter if you've raised money, not raised money, how much you've raised. It comes from the vision that you can impart to people and the way in which you empower them to help you build that vision. And I think that's one of your strengths has been surround yourself with people that are very strong, but who buy into your vision because you're very clearly communicating what the vision is and how, and how it should work. And I think what a, w one thing that, that I've noticed over the last few years is as, as funny rounds have got bigger and more sort of uh, glorified, is people think that is the marker of success and how we win the team is because we've raised money. Ultimately, the best team come because they want to work with other great people around a vision they believe in. And I think that's one of your strengths, actually, is imparting that vision, imparting that desire, that ambition, and putting it all together to a team. Oh, we have a lot of, uh, so we're very much on like simple formulas at checkout, and uh, our three values are very basic. It's like aspire, excel, and unite. 
and aspire is that you got to dream big, and it's not a question of being ambitious, it's just having a very big vision and wanting to go really far. Excel is that there's no point in doing something if you don't do it right, and unite because your decisions should unite people behind you. So I think like the good leaders, what they do is they attract people. And if you're able to attract people, it's a, it's a bit like a self-fulfilling prophecy, you're going to be able to dream bigger. And uh, you know, today we're considering, we're actually executing on certain things we didn't even dream were possible like five years ago, but we have so much more people and we have, I think like, you know, funny enough, for like large founders today or large CEOs, your attrition, the amount of people you have in the org and how you are basically like, you know, uh, how you're able to engage your employees and your colleagues is like super important because it creates your output as a company. Uh, you know, there is, it's, and so fundamentally people will bond, will get excited for a mission that is meaningful. And in a certain sense, the mission here at Checkout is to help businesses grow, is to help businesses recover after COVID and like, we are uh, we're not a company that people see. We are behind most of these very large companies, but we help them basically grow, go to new markets, and in a way, uh, we have, if we were, I don't have the numbers, but I'd look the amount of people that are here in this room today, we're probably touching 70% or 75%. Not only because of Netflix and everyone having a Netflix subscription, but I think it's, a, uh, it's just nice to know that you have a role to play in society. Now, when you say you touch all these people, um, that sort of belies the fact that actually you're in an incredibly complex industry and, and behind sort of that simple front end that we, when we check out at the e-commerce store or we set up our subscription on Netflix, it feels relatively simple to us because of the, the work you and others have done. But behind that is a huge amount of complexity. H how do you tackle that complexity within both payments itself, financial services, and then all the multiple jurisdictions you work across? What's the way in which you simplify it for yourselves in the organization? So I think like, uh, um, I'm going to try not to bore the whole audience with like, a lot of technical terms. Uh, we work in a, in a, like you said, there's the financial regulation to start with. There's the, the, the fact of moving money. And at this point, it's like hundreds of billions of euro that you're actually moving uh, every year. And so that, that alone, re and that is only getting more complex, by the way. It's like, you know, compliance is only going into one direction. So uh, it's like, it's more compliance, but you have, you know, you have different payment methods by regions. You have different regulations by regions, not on the financial side. Typically here in Europe, we have strong customer authentication. You're going to have 3DS2, 3DS1. What do issuers want? You're going to have open banking that is coming in. Actually, most of the merchants, they would choose a company like ours because we're essentially future-proofing their payments. It's this whole logic that, you know, I cannot, I, I, I can certainly not tell you what the future is about. Of course, I have an idea, but I think like, you know, what we can do is that as the world of payments evolve, as you have, you know, like GDPR compliance added on top of it, because, you know, there are like, you know, data sovereignty, which you see in India, for instance, where you need to have your servers there, we can help solve some of those, those problems for like large merchants. And more importantly, historically, a large merchant, he would have had a service, you know, payment service provider, one for Europe, one for Australia, one for Asia, uh, one for the US, and having the licenses everywhere allows the people to say, hey, single API, single regulation, uh, reconciliation, single flow of funds if you want to. Large merchants quite often have different revenue centers, so they're gonna ask you to split the payments across different like revenue centers, but it's basically having a counterpart who is supporting your business as you're growing and as you're attempting new things, being it like buy now, pay later, or crypto, or you know, a lot of the topical uh, topics of the moment. So we, we can't, uh have you here on stage at Slush and not talk about crypto because uh, you're obviously uh, quite bullish on crypto and, and you, ha you, are, you have built and are building a lot of solutions for crypto first companies, uh, both around payments and other things that you're doing. Can you share a little bit about, first of all, why you're so bullish on crypto and second of all, why you've made it a sort of a, a key focus within Checkout? So I think there is a... Um many ways you could actually answer this question. <laughs> um, I'm going to start first, like just the, the intellectual curiosity, which is, uh, I was telling you, I started in payments in 2006. For nearly 10 years, it was mostly the same thing. Uh, and that means like Visa, MasterCard, a few APMs, but I mean, or maybe a hundred of APMs, but you're still like, you know, the same kind of rails. And here comes a technology that has completely different rails. Uh, and fundamentally, when you look at it from a, just like, you know, a helicopter view, uh, it's able to move money instantly from one, well, let's not even say, I think the word money for now is wrong. We can get to this later. It's able to move value from one point to another for free instantly with the ability to track exactly how the money is moving. So you have complete visibility to, uh, to everyone on how the money is moving. That's why people can go and say on Twitter that somebody has an $8 billion position on Shiba Inu 
that he bought for $8,000 like, you know, a few years ago. I, I don't know what's the amount, but I mean, it was, it was a, a, one of those Twitter feeds that we saw. Um, and so if you take this and you take the intellectual curiosity and you're working in payments, you're like, by definition, that is cool. I think like that's the way to look at it. Then I have 1,700 people at checkout who have similar ambitions of like, you know, building cool technology for merchants. So you have different ways to look at it. You have the merchants who are asking you, you have my intellectual curiosity, you have my engineers who are like, hey, we should, you know, in the innovation team, we should look at this like very carefully. And I think like what we did realize is that we tried um, to be part of the, what was originally the, I mean, we tried, we are part of the Libra project that then turned into DM project, which was like, you know, the Facebook endeavor, uh, and I should not say Facebook endeavor, a consortium of like uh, global companies, which out of which many are our clients, Spotify, Shopify, Facebook, you know, like Uber, getting together to ultimately build a stable coin that would essentially solve the problems that I was, you know, raising before and that they could embed. So for us, again, intellectual curiosity behind, uh, you have this opportunity to brainstorm with people that are incredibly smart, that run very large businesses, and seeing like how can we make you know a, a financial system or an OS for money that works at scale with like super smart people. Um, that project did not went as well as we would have hoped. It's well documented. Journalists wrote plenty out of it. But the truth is, in parallel of this, I mean, stable coins went from like you know zero to, you know, hundreds of billions at this point across Tether, USDC, and the other ones that are available, Paxos coin. And I think if I now, you know, think in terms of where we are, uh, we tackle the crypto industry in two ways. A, we, in, we embedded early with like Web3 developers, on-ramps, and uh, exchanges. So we process for most of the world's largest exchanges. Um, and the American ones like Coinbase, the Asian ones like Binance, I mean, we love that space. We like to see what's happening. And it's, again, like in, in, the best part of my job, if I just take one step back, is that I get to work with some of the world's most innovative companies, see them in action. And I think this is like kind of fascinating. But then, you, like you said, there is the world is moving so quickly because just in the last 12 months, this thing like exploded totally. Uh, and so fundamentally, now there's real applications. There is merchants who are asking you to get the stable coin settlement, which is a big thing. I think we'll see a lot of it. I'm not talking about our roadmap. I think like, you know, my marketing team is like, uh, we'll talk about this another time. But I think like stable coin settlements are a big thing. Payments in, in uh, stable coins or payments in crypto is another big thing. There's $3 trillion of crypto out there. That's, that's value. I think like, in, and I think right now, I was like I said, it's not necessarily a currency yet because for currencies, you need regulation and you need a lot of things that are kind of on top of it. But the value is stored. The value is locked in the ledger or in the blockchain. And more importantly, and I think just taking a step back because I was saying, you know, how my team is pushing me to go there. I see two things happening. I see people like you, very smart investors, putting money into crypto like in companies. And there is a lot. So there's more money in crypto than there has ever been. And then I see uh, a lot of very smart kids out of university that would have historically, you know, MIT, Harvard, Stanford, you, you name it. Uh, they would have become an investment banker or whatever, do something. And now they want to build like a Web3 application and they want to be part of DeFi or something like this. And one thing I have seen across the last 15 years of, uh, you know, this internet life of mine from 2006 to now is that when you have at the intersection of money and smart people, usually good things happen. You know, there's going to be a lot of crappy projects. I think there's more than 500 blockchains at this point, and they keep being added all the time. You look on coin market cap, you have new coins being added every single day. But the truth is there will be good stuff happening. And I think like you cannot be a global fintech company and not have teams that are actually part of that thinking and that are challenging themselves. If anything, we love to brainstorm in this company. Like we, we challenge ourselves a lot. So naturally, uh, you know, we have the clients and now we're, we've always, that's another thing also, just the last thing. We've always built for our customers. So we build with our customers in mind. We have a very humble kind of European approach, unlike some of the American companies that tell you, hey, this is the way to go. We know better than you. We tend to go with customers saying, what are your problems? Let us, you know, solve, let us build products that solve your problems. And uh, crypto merchants have, you know, like, you know, are growing so fast that they care about building the Web3. They don't care about how to bring fiat on the Web3 or move fiat out. And, uh, you know, those are the problems we're solving for them. And it's working pretty well. Let me ask you a very quick question before we get to our last question, which is um, we talked earlier about complexity of payments generally, and that was mostly we talked about in the fiat world, the traditional world. And now we just talked about the crypto world. For you, is it more complex to build payments within crypto or to build payments within the fiat world? Um, there's no good way to answer this question. The only thing I can tell you is that 
the, the opportunity in crypto is that it's highly dynamic and we really don't know what the future holds. So, I mean, you still have a scenario where like, you know, China bans like stable coins and so does the US and the whole thing kind of disappears, which I think is very unlikely at this point. But I think like you still have the traditional financial systems that feel kind of threatened by DeFi, by yield products, by staking, by everything that's available out there that's actually pretty powerful when you think about it. So I think like the um, building technology is what we do, solving payment problems is what we do and actually building uh, crypto products is not harder than building fiat products uh, and though we have like you know like I say now nearly 10 year experience in the fiat world uh, but I think you know the best engineers at checkout are very keen on crypto so there's like I have really bright minds that are going against it the one thing I will say is that fiat gives me the certainty of revenue you process the big merchants the crypto world is just like you have it's not uncertainty of revenue it's just like we the, the future will be there so we don't know what it's going to look like so it's harder for planning perspective. So the, in the last uh, minute or so that we have here, uh, I think it would be really interesting for you to share one or two or even three if you have time, sort of uh, pearls of your wisdom, uh, experience, whatever phrase you want to use for the sort of the aspiring founders and entrepreneurs that we have here about what you've learned and what are the one, two, three key lessons for you about, about being an entrepreneur, being a founder. Um, so I'll start with one thing. I always say this is um, you gather all the data and the information with your head, but you should make decisions with the heart. I think it's like quite often I see people over-engineering decisions. Like it's very important to trust your instinct. I think as a CEO, it, maybe it's a collection of experiences and things like this, but like making decisions uh, with the heart is a very important one. And I think the second one I would say is that it's the amount of good decisions that you do that is important, not your ratio of good decisions. So I think like make decisions quickly and working, you know, like getting, making sure your work streams are going, you know, uh, moving fast is what's most important because success comes out of velocity. And if I'm able to like make a lot of good decisions, even if I make a few wrong ones, I don't care. I think at the end of the day, uh, you, uh, being able to iterate, move fast, make a lot of decisions is what creates success. And never forget to, to use the heart to make the decision. I think, I think that's wonderful. It. By the way, the phrase success comes out of velocity, I think is a wonderful phrase. So on that note, thank you, Guillaume. Thanks everybody for listening to us. Thank you, to Tom. Us. Thank you, Have everyone. Thanks.